Hello, and welcome to another episode of Around the Verse, our weekly look behind the scenes of Star Citizen's ongoing development. I'm Sandy Gardner. And I'm Forrest Stefan. Today's show explores the technology designed to keep your Dragonfly or Nox cruising above the ground. But first, the development team has been getting a lot of feedback about Alpha 3.0, from our expanded group of PTU testers. Yes, they have. Thank you, testers. Let's check in with the team to see what issues were addressed and which ones are blockers in this week's Burndown. 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 Welcome back to Burndown, our weekly show dedicated to reviewing progress on the release of Star Citizen Alpha 3.0. We're in PTU right now, so a big thank you to everyone who's testing. It's really helping us out with our main goal of concurrency and stability testing on a large scale. We wouldn't have seen this many new issues without your help. So let's check out how things are going. This week we were really focusing on trying to close out as many features as we possibly can. Uh, by the end of this week, uh, I think besides maybe one or two, those are might slip into next week. But for the most part, we're really aiming to be feature complete um, with all the tier zeros at, uh, on Friday. In Cargo, we've had some very interesting bugs where the system that allows us, the players, to interact with the various object crates kind of got a little strange. In particular, we had one bug where we couldn't really get rid of the cargo crates. Once they were attached to the user's hands, they were stuck there. So recently, I fixed a bug where when you would pick up a piece of cargo off the ground and then die while holding it, you would respawn and the crate would be attached to your hand. And not only would it be attached to your hand, it would be permanently attached to your hand. So if you died subsequently, it would sp still be on your hand. And if you logged out of the game, logged back in later, it would still be there. In fact, the only way to get rid of the, of the crate was to wipe the account and reload it. So it's a pretty serious bug because of that. It's also really funny. We called it box hand. Uh, <laughs> but the um, fix was, Whenever you would pick it up and then die, we would make sure to detach the crate from the hand and make sure that that detachment was persistent. So that fixed the bug. However, it surfaced again later, and it looked like the problem was is that if you crashed while holding the crate, you would still have the issue because the original attachment was still persistent. So to fix it a second time, where the uh, holding any cargo at all is not a persistent attachment. And instead, if you die or crash or anything while holding a piece of cargo in your hand, it won't persist. And so unfortunately, you won't have a piece of cargo attached to your hand, or fortunately, depending on how funny you think it is. <laughs> For shopping, for example, we're in bug fixing and polish mode. Uh, we're feature complete, ready to uh, release, but we just want to get it at that final step uh, ready, uh, ready for you guys. So working through some bugs, uh, for example, some of these shopkeepers, uh, facial animations aren't playing, only in Grim Hex. Uh, we couldn't figure out what was going on, finally identified the cause, and now we're getting that fixed up. Uh, we're also playing around with, the, with getting the ship weapons in the shops, trying to, to uh, mess with the layouts a little bit to see if we can get those situated in the shops um, along with the ship items. It's going to be a tight squeeze, but we'll see if we can, we can get some of that in there. Um, we're also working on uh, inventory issues. Some of the shops uh, are selling things that maybe they shouldn't. So we want to kind of spread it out a little bit, so it encourages you guys to visit all the different shops, get all the different inventories. But uh, other than that, uh, shopkeepers are looking pretty good, too. We're having a final review this week, uh, and we should sign those guys off here pretty soon as well. The commodities kiosk is pretty much closed out now. We've just got a final few very minor bugs that we're just ironing out, so that that feature is pretty much complete. So with Mission Givers, um, we've put it into a QATR, which is basically our way of saying that test is, is able to basically go full bore on those and make sure that um, it's hitting the quality level that we need. Uh, so all the behaviors are complete. We're looking at, we're missing some minor transition animations, but we should get those in very quickly. Uh, I will do a review of that either today or tomorrow, and then it should be good to go. Lately, I was mostly working with bugs related to the mission givers. That includes the setup, that includes the uh, bugs, behaviors, all that stuff. Uh, we had lots and lots of uh, small issues because we had a lot of untested technology. We had a lot of assets that were never been in game before, 
and we had behaviors that were only made for demos. Most of our bugs were related to the edge cases, where, for example, player decides to stand from the chair and leave in the middle of the, of the conversation, or leaves the room, or just stands still and stares you for like 20 minutes. What happens then? Uh, it, it's all about catching those small things that players would think about doing, the things that you would never do in the actual demo. This past weekend we had a review of all of our ships. We went in and, and uh, the lead tech designers, Kirk Tomei and, and John Crew, uh, went through all the different ships and, and just kind of ran them through their paces, made sure all the different um, checks off the check boxes were, were, were present, um, mainly just with ship setup. So we, uh, we have a big list of issues, or not a big list, I should, should say a smaller list now, uh, of issues that we need to work out and get fixed up before we finally release. Uh, but we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, the functionality is, is pretty much there. We just got to work out the final kinks. On turrets, one of the more interesting things that has happened is a result of the code that we put in place to allow planets to rotate. Now, this means that we are rotating a zone of space inside another zone of space. And this has had some interesting effects on how projectiles' trajectories are calculated and how our unmanned and manned turrets operate those projectile trajectories. For the last week I've been working on uh, the targeting system with the behind weapons, including your pistol, your uh, vehicle weapons on ships and turrets. The problem was that the entire engine was built on this aim controller providing a world space position. And so what we had to deal was that whatever input that we took in had to be converted into zone space, saved in zone space, and then converted back out. This would also have to happen uh, between remote clients so that you would aim where you intended and whoever was on the other side would also be aiming at the same, would see you aiming at that same position. So we had to make sure that the number that you converted to in zone space would, con uh, would be spread amongst the other clients and then converted back into a world space position. In the last weeks, turrets have received a lot of attention from, uh, from me from the AI standpoint, of course. Um, it was not completely about bugs or, fix or fixes, but rather um, there were features that were uh, much needed. So there are mainly two features that we introduced. That one is the line of fire checks, and the other one is the accuracy control. Uh, the line of fire checks mm, are there to ensure that uh, weapons uh, are not firing uh, at nothing else but uh, what is the intended target. So for example, weapons should not fire across surfaces of buildings. Uh, the accuracy control uh, is there to um, define and assign a skill for, uh, for NPCs. So in the, in the accuracy, for example, is, is there to um, it basically means how good is an NPC to shoot when shooting to a target. With the IFCS and the second stage afterburner, uh, I feel that we're in very good states um, with those. Uh, we will do minor, um, minor polishing, minor bugs, um, but for the most part, those are where we feel like uh, it will go out with 3.0, um, minus any, uh, any kind of major complaints from PTU or anything like that, then we'll, we'll investigate those and see if they're, uh, they're valid with Chris's vision and then push forward. So we found this uh, bug recently, well, it was not a bug, but kind of a bad situation in the game, where uh, you could actually go to a landing area and try to land, but you didn't know where to go because everything was like uh, everything was with a similar color. You couldn't see clearly which landing pad was yours. And with these new rules we have now, uh, if you try to land in a place where you shouldn't, then you get uh, like a criminality rating and so on. So it's not ideal. So we had to do some changes to make this actually uh, proper, properly. Uh, shown to the player, so the player can actually know what's going on. Uh, so in this case, uh, the first thing we did was just changing the landing pads, because before uh, you didn't have any assigned landing pad, you could land anywhere you wanted. And now, uh, since you have to request, once you get one landing pad assigned to you, that's the only one 
with the UI showing you that's the highlighted area, that's the place you should go. Yeah. Uh, we have also like increased the size of the UI, make it more visible, more uh, visible from a greater distance. So in general, just easier to see, easier to identify, and hopefully it will cause less problems for players. So with StarMap, we feel from MobiGlass perspective, that's done, it's finished. Um, we've been implementing it into uh, the ship radar. Um, so when you're actually in the cockpit and you can switch between your radar and StarMap at the same time. Uh, we're in progress of working that out. Um, the first rollout will probably be to any ships that have 3D radars. And then from there, um, at later release, we, we will be working towards uh, ships that uh, have 2D radars and also 2D to 3D radar conversions. So that's, um, that will come in future releases, but at least in the short term um, for 3.0, we will be looking at releasing the, that. One of the systems I've been working on for 3.0 is the new hint system that we have in game. Um, the way the hint system works is um, we've uh, created a bunch of um, hint event macros that we've been uh, scattering around the game code um, so we can fire events from various uh, actions that take place within the game. Things such as, um, for example, we'll have an event that fires when uh, you get out of your bed in the PU, when you use your Moby glass, when you're low on oxygen, when you're low on ammo, um, all those kind of things. Um, the way these events then work is um, we have uh, we have an array of uh, hint triggers within the hint system that are listening out for certain events, dependent on how design have wanted to um, actually show the hints to the players in game. Um, so, for example, you might have a hint trigger um, that's waiting for the um, event that's uh, that's fired when you use your Moby glass. That hint trigger can then say, OK, show me this uh, hint UI string at the bottom of the screen to explain how to use more of the Moby glass functionality at that point. Um, we also have um, triggers um, that work with uh, suppression events so that, for example, if you're actually doing um, certain events in game before hints might have triggered about them, we can stop those hints from showing so that we don't end up telling you over and over again how to do things that you've already figured out how to do. So we try to make a, a nice sort of dynamic um, hint system that's uh, there to guide you through some of the new features and functionalities in 3.0. Um, I'm pretty pleased with how this has gone because it's been one of the more straightforward systems to get into game. Um, so for 3.0 we're uh, reaching feature complete status for uh, what we want to do for this patch with it. Um, in the future we'll probably layer some extra functionalities and polish, put in some new hint events as well as we expand the feature set. But um, for free zero, we're pretty happy with what we've got. With the personal inner thought, we are working on the finalized menu for that. So when you look down um, or interact with this, then it will link to different inner thoughts as far as either opening something, interacting with your weapons, emoting, so on and so forth. And then we're just finishing off the menu on that, and then that should be golden. UI team has been working on the Holo visor and basically just heads up display on the ships. Um, we've gotten the, the holograms working again uh, based off of the new item 2.0. Uh, we will be putting them into the proper places and everything like that. But as, and we're also switching everything over from 2D markers to 3D markers so that in star map as well as in the AR version of the game, everything that you see is a 3D marker and then making sure that that works with combat and, and even just looking at a ship, targeting the ship, and the animations associated with that. So those have all been worked on and uh, a fair amount of that has been checked in, but we're still, we're still in the final polishes of the actual heads-up display and the feedback for your ship as well as the targeted ship. The team has made some really, really good progress over the last week for 3.0, which uh, 
resulted in us being able to go to PTU on Wednesday last week. Uh, we've made some subsequent pushes to the PTU since then, uh, the last of those being on, uh, on Saturday. We had uh, QA come in and we uh, managed to actually storm through the checklist by the looks of things, which is pretty good. We've managed, we pushed up to Eva Car at PTU on Saturday at about 6 o'clock, something like that. Um, which had fixes in for the disconnections problems that we were having from since Wednesday, which is like 15,006 disconnect mm -hmm. error, which seems to have been caused by a problem in the persistence cache, which uh, Jason Ely and Tom Sawyer took a look at and got fixed up, and also had the network latency issues that we were seeing fixed up as well by Clive and George. Because of the um, United States Thanksgiving holidays, it was entirely driven in the UK, which was the first time we've ever done that. Um, and the UK QA over here, led by Sam Child, were able to do the checklists for the first time and um, actually we successfully pushed the build out, so that was really good. Um, following on from that, actually going to the larger PTU audience, it highlighted quite a few issues that we hadn't seen with the, the limited numbers on Eva Carty. Um, one of the big issues was a latency issue that presented itself at first as rubber banding, um, and like strong lag and um, we actually had quite a few people investigating that from um, Carsten and DE and Clive here and um, it was quite a difficult one to nail down because we had limited resources with Thanksgiving um, but thankfully Ahmed over in the US he was also present and helped out quite a bit um, and we were eventually I think it was by Thursday we were able to tie that one down and get that one closed out and um, thanks to going to the larger audience in the PTU um, on Friday, we came across some nasty crashes that actually stopped us from pushing. Um, the, they were to do with um, the audio of Gatling guns and um, was causing the build to break. So we had the audio team here and Rob Johnson and um, they stuck around on Friday evening and were able to get a fix in, uh, which meant on Saturday we were able to um, push again because we had enough resources in on the UK to push another build over the weekend for the Evocati. And the bug I'm going to talk about is a little pesky bug that plagued us for about eight months now and which happens only on release builds. So what happens is when you, when you walk through a level like uh, AQ11 and you fire your gun, sometimes the reverb cuts out completely. And we don't know why, because it doesn't make sense. It doesn't happen on development builds, only on shipping builds. Um, so we had to spend some time to get down to the culprit of the problem and it was quite interesting what we found out. So when the reverb system is initialized with everything, it reads data from XML. Um, so for development builds, this XML data is human, uh, like readable by a human. However, for shipping builds, it's, um, it's binary. So it uses um, a different XML reader inside the engine to figure out what kind of um, data it should set up and so on. And between those, uh, between that binary XML reader and the normal XML reader, there's a mismatch. So they yield different outcomes for different, uh, for the same data. Um, <coughs> so in our case, it was that our uh, XML contained a Boolean attribute with a humanly written string true, um, as opposed to false, so T-R-U-E. And what the shipping version of the binary XML reader reads, uh, expects, is actually a one or a zero. So it always failed in shipping builds and we didn't notice for a long time. It's out there in the PTU in the wild, so we needed to fix it as soon as possible. So the fix is not gonna, is not gonna be that, or, so the fix is nothing that um, I will do. The engine team will do this, probably today. Um, but it's a really fun case of, um, Audio making the problem really, really apparent, but it has nothing to do with audio itself. So generally, as we push to the PTU and we go through our, clo our closed test groups, we see more and more convoluted bugs and harder to reproduce bugs. And these are generally the really, really nasty issues that we've got to perfect and get rid of before we go to the widest community, which is our live release. Getting thousands of people playing concurrently stresses the game servers and services like shopping and quantum travel in a way that's impossible to do in earlier stages of testing. This has allowed us to get an overall view of stability and server performance. While in PTU, we can look daily at what the team has accomplished, release updates using our Delta Patcher, and get quick turnaround on issues preventing a live release. 
We're making steady progress, and at the time of filming this, we're at 240 must-fix issues for our live release candidate of Star Citizen Alpha 3.0. The team has checked in over 491 updates to the branch, and while we're closing dozens of issues every day, leadership evaluates what's absolutely necessary to address to go live as quickly as possible. See you next week here on Burndown. Remember, you can always dig into more development details by checking out our weekly production schedule report on the website. Yes, you can, and Alpha 3.0 introduces a variety of new features and locations. Some of the biggest are Crusader's Three Moons. To help players explore these vast and varied landscapes, we've introduced the Dragonfly and the Nox. These open canopy vehicles created a special challenge to design and implement, as they're technically not ground vehicles or ships, but are instead a hybrid of the two. That's right, these vehicles required special gravlev tech to hover and fly just above the ground. Now let's see what the development team had to do to get this unique flight model working. Hi, I'm Matt Lightfoot, one of the associate producers here at Foundry 42 in the UK. I'm David Coulson, I'm a junior game play programmer at CIG. Andrew Nicholson, tech designer at Foundry 42. All right, my name is John Pritchett, I'm a senior physics programmer here at CIG. Uh, I'm a flight model specialist. I work mostly with the spaceships uh, and really any control systems for, for different types of vehicles, EVA, missiles, that sort of thing. So Gravlev is a system that forms part of our uh, flight mechanics. It specifically affects most of our bikes on the planet, so this is the system that makes them levitate off the ground. What we wanted to do was recreate, uh, you know, the iconic uh, hover bike like you see in Star Wars or the, you know, hover vehicles also from Star Wars. but. Of course, we wanted to create this, uh, you know, as, as realistically as we can. Uh, so, the, the concept of gravlev for us is this idea that it's, it's kind of like maglev. You know, you have this upward force that depends on the the, the, the distance between, you know, the, the the elevation of the bike or the vehicle to the ground. So, the lower you get, the more upward force is available. The farther you get away. Uh, you know, the less force that it can create. It's, it's, a, it's a, a, an extra feature on top of the existing flat system. So bikes are pretty much considered ships uh, in, in the flat control system. And we have this extra added layer on them that basically queries the environment around them and tries to orient the bikes uh, vertically. First of all, we just say, okay, we would like you to be hovering at this height. And then using the motion control algorithms that I said before, we can specify a positional goal and we'll say, hey, we want the bike to be at this position. So what we do is instead of saying a position, we say we want the bike to be at this height. And then we can let the motion control algorithms work out how much force you need to hold the bike at this height. And so once you're at that point, we're okay. And then we have, we have some extra layers on top of that. So we have like, if you're moving really fast, we increase the elevation because you know, you're, you're inclined to hit something if you're traveling fast. If you're turning, we work out how much force is being used to turn the ship and we, we roll it based on that. So you, know, you can sort of lean into turns like you're on a bike. And then of course we have the collision avoidance which will query if there's, you're about to hit something and then try and elevate the bike over it. There's some limits to that. Uh, we, we also had the discussion recently of, do we want to at some point say, hey, you, you intentionally just drove into a wall, we're not gonna try and stop you um, because otherwise you'll get you know, flung so high into the air that it may take a couple of minutes to get down to the ground again. So at some point, the collision avoidance system will say, hmm, this object is too much for us to bother. We'll just let you crash into it. Um, and I think that's a reasonable compromise. It's really hard to decide um, at what point do we let the bike crash because generally you don't want it to crash at all. It's irritating for the player if you're constantly crashing. But there's a point where you've just drove into a wall. It's your fault. And so we now allow that. Previously we didn't, uh, which I think caused some of the issues of the bikes getting flung into the air. A lot of games when they do grab lever hover bike type systems, they uh, they tend to use sort of a faked uh, you know collision, or it's almost like a hidden wheel or some kind of a, a, a surface that's that's riding on the ground but you don't see it. And so it, it very very closely follows the, the terrain. But I've modeled this, uh, you know, to, to actually work from, an, you know, a, an upward acceleration. Uh, so the closer you get, the, f the more it can push. 
up so it's more of a bounce and and you're never really like, you know just following the terrain perfectly you're always just kind of skimming over it um, and so like if if the ground comes up too quickly you're gonna skid off it a little bit you know uh, it's it's not perfect I always actually try to uh, de design the the control systems uh, for for our vehicles as realistically as possible so that you know I have imperfect information and uh, so I'm not cheating uh, so in the case of a gravel vehicle you know you have sensors that are able to detect your, your proximity to the ground below you and then also um, looking out ahead to kind of get a sense for what's coming. Um, but it's not perfect so there might be like a rock you know that the sensors don't quite pick up on and so if you're not careful you're going to slam into that. So the player has the ability to kind of adjust your elevation a little bit to, to work along with, with the control system. So if you think you're going to collide with a rock. You can kind of go up a little bit, and you know, uh, or if maybe you're going to bump your head on an out outcropping or something, push down a little bit under it. You may have noticed at the, the CitizenCon stream uh, when Glenn was flying the Knox around, he was being really, really careful um, because at the time, the Graveler bikes were quite unstable, and if you clipped a rock or you clipped some bit of geometry, it would suddenly flip into the air and spin and lose control. With the sort of vague goal of they don't feel really good and they lose control. Uh, I was tasked with figuring out why and trying to address some of those issues. And so we immediately, like John helping out, um, we went in and, and tried to, to take a, 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 an overview of the whole system and figure out you know, what could be the problem. Um, and we have things like, hey, if the thrusters are being damaged and they can't provide enough thrust to either correct a loss of control or they just can't provide enough thrust to even function, you're going to lose control, or maybe you know you're running out of fuel, and the thrusters don't have enough fuel to to counteract the spin. But then we have other issues, like the gravlev system, for example, basically fires these rays out in front of you while you're moving um, to detect if there's any objects in the way. And if there are, it will force you up a little bit to try and get you over those obstacles. But the problem is, it doesn't really have any limit to that. So if you, for example, run up to a wall, it'll just fling you right up and you'll fly into the air, um, which is, you know, it's sort of what you want, but there's limits to it, right? So we went and had a look at those things um, and decided, okay, um, the damage and the fuel actually didn't appear to be as much of an issue as it was. Um, and we took a close look at the forces that the gravel lift system generates as you're you know, moving around and figured out that there was actually some like bugs. You know, the system is so um, complicated, not complicated, but it's like, um, I guess highly strung that very small bugs um, can have very subtle effects that you, that you know there's something wrong, but you don't know why. And so one of the issues we found was the, the, the ray casting system, which is the system that fires rays out, and you know, the whole game uses it for all sorts of things. And we also use it for firing rays down at three points on, from the gravel bikes to figure out where the ground is. And occasionally, those rays hit the ground and go, hey, we hit the ground. And they come back and tell you that the ground is 12,000 kilometers away. And you're like, that's wrong. And it obviously then, you know, screws with all the other maths and everything goes awry and you lose control. Um, so we found a few issues like that. Um, and one of the big things for us was the, the despin system. All ships in the game have this despin system where if you get knocked by a missile or something, or you, you know, clip a wing on something, and your ship begins to spin, it will immediately stop all other control and focus on using all thruster force to try and slow down the spin and keep you from losing control. And so we brought that system over to Gravlev. Uh, it, it was there before, but it wasn't really well tested and suited to Gravlev. So we sort of mixed it in with the Gravlev and we say, for example, hey, um, if you're spinning, stop trying to elevate yourself because you know what happens is you'll start spinning and maybe the front of your bike will be pointing toward the ground and it'll say, hey, there's an obstacle in front of you. And it'll try and kick you up in the air while you're still spinning. Um, so now we say, you know, hey, you're spinning, just stop everything else you're doing, stop running the gravel of simulation and just try and slow yourself down and then we dedicate all power and force to being able to do that. And once you stop spinning, uh, we then try and align you upwards. So we'll figure out what your orientation is and set your goal to vertical, and we try and get you, you know, oriented vertically. 
And we also had some issues, like we had loads of reports that the Gravelab bikes get stuck upside down and they can't get out because they can't reorient themselves because like, you know, the driver's head or something is clipping into the ground. We added this new system to basically say, hey, are you clipping the ground? We can ask the physics system if you're touching anything right now. And if you are, push you up and then try and reorient the ship again. And the result is that nobody's reported that they're getting stuck upside down anymore, which is really good. And this is, you know, this is a few examples of like a huge number of changes across the board that have just tried to push this more and more stable. We fixed a few more issues with uh, the balance system that uh, tries to keep the bike steady. So this has say, you know, you've done your three raycasts and assuming one of the raycasts um, doesn't give you 12,000 kilometers as the result, it will say, okay, we now have enough information to create this plane and using that we can orient the ship to, I say, keep saying ship, I mean gravelet bike. Um, but we have enough information to orient it vertically. Um, and we also don't want to, for example, if you're moving over some really rough terrain and there's like a hole on one side of the, the bike, we don't want the whole thing to suddenly lurch over and, and, and move. We'd like you to have a little bit of air of, hey, the other two points are not haven't encountered some issue and you haven't, you know, you haven't gone over a pothole. So just don't, you know, shift the bike over and stuff. And it's worked really well. Um, there was some designers the other day that were trying to find issues for when you damage the thruster, the, the gravel of thrusters underneath the bikes. And they kept complaining that they couldn't crash it, which is, you know, fantastic news. A few, a few weeks ago, we had complaints that crashing the bikes were too easy. And now we have complaints that they can't crash the bikes, which is good. Dave's made some really, really good progress as we've reported in our burn down reports. And he, he's making it feel far, far smoother and also adding in some mechanics where you transition from hover mode up to the atmospheric flight. Because obviously these bikes aren't just gonna hover along the planet, you're also going to want to be able to kind of fly them, think Blade Runner style. Um, so he's doing a lot of work there and also tightening them up so that Andy can do a full balance pass on it as well. And that they also work with our atmospheric flight systems like turbulence and drag so that these bikes are still controllable and kind of, you know, obviously fun for you guys to use. I've been working to get the performance of the bikes the way we want them. So much like any other ship balance stuff, when it comes to performance, it's the same kind of thing where I'd basically run the numbers to see how much acceleration, how much maximum g-force it should allow, what's the average acceleration, what's the maximum acceleration, and then work out uh, using our third order motion what the jerk value should be for each axis of the of the of the bike. Um, it's it's much different because we're kind of allowing a lot higher acceleration on these bikes maybe than, than, than you might get because the, the velocity is so low. I think the, the reasoning behind it, so velocity is low, you can have a bit more acceleration. I mean, that's the way I see it. So like, whereas you're not going as fast unless you're using the afterburner, it means you can be a little bit snappy on the turning. For the longest time we've had bikes in and they perform badly, whereas people are constantly complaining about the slidiness. Because it's when you when you turn on a bike and you look the direction you want to go and you feel like you're drifting out, it really doesn't feel right. It's the ships kind of are like that when you've got the safeties off, and that's like that's the, the that's the way we want it. You want to be fighting the slide using boost and afterburner. It needs to be a hard challenge. We want to have that skill level. I think the bikes, it's a little less a little less. Um, okay to do that. I think you need to be a little bit tighter, have better performance from the off so that people feel in control. Mainly because of the, the hazards that are out there. A lot of these planets are so rocky. The terrain so, it undulates all over the place. So the, the gravelers have the challenge of staying above these rocks. And if your performance is poor and you're sliding out, it makes it so much worse that you just end up hitting rocks and exploding. So I need to make sure that, that, that these bikes are controllable enough that you get in them after waiting so long to try them, that you don't just fly into a rock and explode. And that's really the the X uh, acceleration on the X-axis, the making sure that that's high enough that they can turn well. Um, but it is just making sure I've raised the numbers enough to get the ship flying like tight to the ground and tight turns. 
but still making it so that if you use boost to get basically chuck more fuel into the engines and overdrive them, you still get that feeling that you're getting more sharper turns when you when you use it. The grav level automatically calculates where, what it needs to do when it comes to a rock and raises you up, lowers you down accordingly. We do also have something that David's worked on is the, you can now strafe up and down. We really wanted that, I mean, with it, it's not only the way that you transition between ground hover mode and space flight or in atmospheric flight in the bikes. If there is a large rock coming up, we don't want to make it so it automatically lifts you for everything. I mean, there is a bit of give and take. Small rocks, yes, we wanted to bounce over them without you having any input. But if you're coming towards a large rock, you do have the ability to strafe up to get higher and dodge that. It's really important that we had some player input to control this stuff so it isn't just purely um, whilst, yes, automation is good with some of this stuff, you, you, having player input matter with the gravel is important too. Gravel vehicle tends to, all, so far, has always been uh, also a, a normal flight vehicle. So it has thrusters that, that can control it um, on all six degrees of freedom, just like any vehicle. Uh, but when you go into gravel mode, it's basically removing the upward thrust and downward thrust and, and because this is a more efficient way to, to travel across land. Uh, so um, all the upward force will be generated by the grav levs and all the downward force will come from gravity. Uh, so if you're cruising along and you hit, uh, you know, like a, a rim of a canyon, you're just gonna fly off and the only thing that's gonna bring you down is gravity. Uh, and then as you approach the ground, the grav levs get close enough, they kick in and it'll cushion you in and you'll just continue on from there. So the question of your ability to transition in and out of normal flight to gravlev mode is, is really separate from that. Um, I mentioned before that you have the ability to kind of raise and lower your, your goal elevation, uh, which is normally um, automatically controlled by the gravlev system based on the terrain that you're going over. But you can ri ri rise up to a certain level and if you hold it, you know, I think strafe up is, is the, the control that we're using for that. If you hold that at that peak level for just a moment, you'll break out of that and continue flying on. So uh, that, that's how you would get out into normal flight mode. And then uh, once you fly back down within range of the ground and uh, it's uh, safe for it to drop back into gravlev, then, then it'll continue on into gravlev mode automatically. We pretty much have the ability to uh, control your elevation in gravlev. So previously, you know, we say, hey, this is a safe height to be, you know, skimming along the ground. Um, but we now actually give you a little bit more control. So if you try and strafe up and down in gravlev, you can move the target height that you're hovering at. Um, and there is sort of like this, this invisible plane that is the limit of gravlev. So you will hold space and you'll strafe up until you get to this point and you'll feel the bike sort of being stuck there for a second. Keep holding space, the bike will like pop out and you'll see on the UI that it's changed into SCM mode. And at this point you're flying. Uh, so you can lift up and you can fly around, you can go to much higher speeds because you're effectively a, a plane at this point. You can uh, fly around, you can go wherever you want and past that point, if you want to return, you need to go below this artificial plane that you popped out of um, and the system automatically pops you back in. And you can't, for example, accidentally pop out of that system by, you know, if you like went off the edge of a cliff, we won't kick you out of gravlev, even though you're, I don't know, 20 meters in the air. So you'll fall back again. Um, and this was sort of a decision to, to not confuse players that they're constantly changing the handling. Like if you pop the player out of gravlev mode, their top speed suddenly increases because they're a plane. And it could be quite confusing if this happens without the player's intention. So we ask you to explicitly say, hey, I want to actually fly right now. And at that point, you'll pop out and you'll fly away. Um, and this is, you know, from the atmospheric flight point of view, this has added the new challenges of having the bikes control reasonably well in atmospheric flight. Um, they're really small and they're, they're easy to push off course. And so there's not really a lot of, um, there's not really not a huge amount of force that's required to make them lose control or spin in atmosphere. And so we have to sort of more carefully decide how to apply the atmospheric forces when you're flying like that. And it also means we can do other things um, with the gravlev bikes where we can, first of all, you can 
well, you're sitting on the back of the bike, right? So if you try, currently, if you try and go into space on a gravel bike, you can, um, but it's not the intended design. Uh, what we actually want is for you to, for you to burn up and, you know, be killed by the, the move to space. Um, so what we would want you to do then, and this is what the intended design is, is for you to say, come in with your cutlass or your, your constellation or something, and you're in flying up uh, high and the bike like comes out of the back of your cutlass and you could fly it and have full control all the way down to the surface and then as you rejoin the surface it'll pop into hover mode and you can skate along like you're on a bike. So it's quite interesting what happens on the reverse when you're going like really high cruise after burner speeds and you come into these zones where you want to switch to hover and how the ship deals with the deceleration which is basically using its own hover mode deceleration rather than its flight mode deceleration. So there will be these periods where you come into land, cross the threshold, change the hover mode, and you're going to have to take a while to slow down. So you have to really judge how much space you have when you make that transition. Atmospheric drag and, and these things actually come into play with, with gravlev vehicles as well. It's not just spaceships. So um, the higher up you go, you know, the, the more drag comes into play. So the idea is that when you're in a, a gravlev mode and you're really hugged up tight to the ground and your gravlevs are working, it's sort of in a, a, a I call it terraplaning, but uh, it's like a drafting mode almost. It's like de uh, decreased dr drag, uh, so you can slide very, very, uh, very easily uh, when you're close to the ground. And so, like you're, especially when you start looking at afterburner speeds, uh, you're not going to be able to reach those speeds um, when you're at higher elevations because the drag is keeping you back, holding you back, and, and you're reaching terminal velocity. So you really only reach those speeds when you're on a nice flat, you know, and uh, and you're not bouncing up into the air. Definitely benefits you to read the terrain and and uh, stay down and avoid jumps, uh, you know, and, and try to stay tight to the ground for long stretches, and that's where you really get flat out cruising. You know, it's going to be very important in racing, uh, you know, because the difference between, uh, you know, going over a jump and, and, you know, the drag pushing against you is going to slow you down versus somebody who maybe takes a different course, uh, then, you know, they'll, they'll get an advantage uh, at that, in that moment. So I think that'll result in a lot of sort of, you know, give and take in these races. So the bikes are a better option when you need to get somewhere quickly and you aren't that bothered about risk and people engaging you. Um, obviously they're quicker than rovers, but rovers have a turret on top for defense and they also have total cover around, around the pilot and the co-pilot or driver and co-driver as the case is. So it's just to get somewhere quickly without, without much armor really. Gravlev is really, really important to us because with 3.0 obviously we're implementing the procedural planets and you guys need a way to be able to travel around these planets quickly that isn't just your ships you know we've got the rovers which are fairly slow but you know well protected and give you plenty of tactical options but then we've also got the bikes that are lighter armored you're more easy you're, you know you're easier to be killed and the gravlev is kind of the system that sits with those bikes mainly because we've got the, the planets those bikes need gravlev and a system to keep them hovering without being flung off into the atmosphere in low-G environments. What I love about, uh, you know, terraplaning is that, uh, you know, every now and then you're cruising along and you reach a flat and, and, you know, the bike will just settle down really low. And, you know, when you recognize that, you punch the afterburners and you just start cruising at a speed that you can't reach any other way. You know, and then once you're, you're going at that high speed, you're, you know, white knuckling it. You're really kind of reading the train coming up because any little bump's gonna send you up into the air and it's gonna, you know, the drag is gonna slow you back down. Currently, the Gravlev system is, is feature complete. Any extra work is pretty much polish. Uh, we have some, like for example, it, it can be quite difficult when you're traveling at high speed in a Gravlev bike to shoot people because they have guns on the front. Um, and so we had this idea that we would allow you to have a bit of pitch control so you can move the ship like this, which you can't, you can't do at the moment. But it would mean that you have a little bit more range to shoot your gun. So we're gonna do that. Um, but past that point, it's feature complete and we're quite happy with it. Um, extra work is just making it feel really good and making it you know, ready for prime time and, and, and polished enough that everyone can use it quite easily. But aside from that, the system is, is we're really happy with where it's at and we're satisfied that it's finished. It's a lot of fun, yeah. Um, it's like every Star Wars fan's dream, isn't it, to get on a speeder bike, fly across the planet. The phrase terraplaning really seems to capture the feeling of what it's like to fly these vehicles. Yeah, as you heard, there's no invisible wheel at work. 
the GravLev tech is actually calculating the upward force the bike needs to keep from hitting the ground. That really makes it a unique flight experience in the game. It sure does. And that's all for today's show. But before we go, a big congratulations to the Observer Test winners. Out of thousands of entries, seven randomly chosen winners now have an Anvil Hawk added to their fleet. You also have until December 11th to help pick the next Drake ship. Head to our website and cast your vote. And while you're there, check out the Q&As on the Hawk and the Hammerhead, which are still on sale until December 11th. There will also be a Q&A focused on land claim licenses, which will be published before the end of the sale. And finally, our holiday live stream is Thursday, December 21st, which focuses on Squadron, Squadron 42. 42. Stay tuned next week for some details about the show. A big thanks to all of our subscribers. Your support allows us to make even more content for community engagement. And December's ship of the month is the Drake Buccaneer, so be sure to take it out for a test flight. And thanks to all of our backers, we couldn't make such an ambitious game with such wide-ranging ships like the Dragonfly and Nox without your support, so thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. And until next week, we will see you Around, around the Verse. Thank you for watching. So if you want to keep up with the latest and greatest in the Star Citizen and Squadron 42's development, please follow us on our social media channels. See you soon.